Hi, everybody. We are Sasha and Camille, and we're here representing the team behind a report called Bug Bounties for Algorithmic Harms, which was just published by the Algorithmic Justice League. The report looks at how people who work to minimize algorithmic harm can learn from uh, infosec practices, especially from vulnerability reporting and disclosure practices. You can read the full report on agl.org slash bugs, and it's filled with great information. Hi, everyone. So I'm Sasha. I use they and she pronouns, and I'm director of research and design at AJL. Let's start with a little bit about the history behind the report. Back in 2017, when Dr. Joy Bulamwini, founder of AJL, exposed how facial recognition technologies, or FRTs, fail more on women and darker skinned people, and most on dark skinned women, she and her collaborators triggered a very adversarial reaction from industry. So FRT vendors initially responded by attempting to discredit the research and the researchers, but eventually they had to backtrack, especially after a NIST study confirmed the findings. So this is an example of how what's happening currently in the fight against algorithmic harm has parallels in the early history of InfoSec, when companies were constantly attempting to discredit, sue, and even file criminal charges against hackers just for finding and sharing security vulns. Before we go any further, though, let's clarify what we mean by algorithmic harm. So algorithmic harm occurs when an organization or individual uses an algorithmic system to automate classification, prediction, recommendations, or scoring in a process that harms people in some way. So algorithmic harm could involve loss of freedom or opportunity, violation of rights or physical safety, social stigma or affronts to dignity, or even a loss of life. Now, these days, people often talk about racial or gender bias in training data and that is part of it, but algorithmic harms are not only about biased data. They may arise at any stage in the life cycle of an algorithmic system, during data collection and classification, in model development and testing, or post-deployment in the context of use by humans. And this is not just hypothetical. People in the real world experience algorithmic harm every day, for example, in 2020, the ACLU sued on behalf of Robert Williams, who's pictured here. He was falsely arrested in front of his wife and two daughters, thanks to the failure of facial recognition technology used by the Detroit police. He was mistakenly identified as someone who had committed a theft. So algorithmic harm can be life-changing. And the idea of rewarding folks who might be able to help prevent algorithmic harm makes complete sense similar to how rewarding hackers for discovering bones makes sense. But in both cases, the devil is in the details. So to help us more fully understand the, draw, the draws and the drawbacks of bug bounties and whether they might really be useful for algorithmic harm, we turned to fellow practitioners and researchers who were kind enough to share their wisdom, experience, and ideas with us for this report. And today, we'll share our insights with you through a handful of mini vignettes from the short but colorful history of bug bounties. First, we will take a look at a, a wacky historical bounty as a way to highlight some central themes from our research. Then we'll jump ahead at the moment at which traditional infosec bounties start to encompass a greater range of social technical issues, which happens around 2018. Then we will look at Twitter's bias bounty challenge from last year before closing with a look ahead to what's happening right now with proctoring software and what this may suggest for the future of algorithmic harms bounty. A key contribution of our work is to take a look at the verities of bug bounties and associated mechanisms for reporting and disclosing vulnerabilities and to abstract some key programmatic differences. This is what we call our design levers. How these levers are configured really matters for these programs impact on transparency, accountability, community building, and many other aspects that we care deeply about. We are building on previous work, noting that many of these bug bounty programs vary by how they define market access, program duration, and compensation. And to those design, we add whether public disclosure is guaranteed and on a pre-established timeframe, how a given program is managed, is it fully in-house or is it outsourced to some degree, perhaps to the platforms like HackerOne or BugCrowd? 
what is officially considered in scope and what level of access are researchers actually given, whether a program is voluntary or adversarial. And in other words, like has the target organization consented to receiving vul vulnerability report? All right, let's go into our first vignette. Okay, so this is a challenge lock from the 18th century. It was manufactured by Joseph Brahma and had almost 500 million possible combinations. And you can see on the cover of the lock, uh, there's an inscription. And most copies of this lock were not inscribed in this way. This particular one was created to sit in Brahma's shop front as a kind of advertising. He's saying, I'm so confident in the strength of this lock that I'll pay you if you can pick it. Well, Brahma's lock remained unbreakable and the bounty uncollected for decades, 61 years to be precise, until 1851, when another locksmith, Alfred Charles Hobbes, succeeded in picking Brahma's lock after over 50 hours of tinkering during the course of two weeks. Considering this early security bounty using our design levers, the challenge is voluntary rather than adversarial since the locksmith is the one who offered the challenge, compensated in the form of a one-time bounty because only after he managed to pick the lock and since he was the first one to do it, Hobbes was paid for his discovery. Actually, he was well compensated. The bounty was 200 guineas, which is about $20,000 in today's currency. In terms of the disclosure model, Hobbes reportedly performed the feat in front of journalists live, which is about as full disclosure as it's possible to go. Around the same time, Hobbes was also making the case for publishing weaknesses in lock design. He has a book from 1853 called Construction of Locks and Safes, and he wrote, quote, the spread of the knowledge is necessary to give fair play to those who might suffer by ignorance. It was open participation because anyone was able to participate. The duration was ongoing, really ongoing, 61 years ongoing. And finally, regarding scope and access, this challenge focused on picking the lock. So there was physical access and the details of how the lock worked were public. All right, so we learned that bug bounties are really not a new concept and that they can be applied to various systems. And you know what happens next, bug bounties come to InfoSec. And we cover some of that historical trajectory of how early InfoSec bug bounties um, really evolved. We talk about this in our report, but it has been well covered by others, including here at Enigma and particularly at the moment where our report came out, two other reports by data and society researchers came out at the same time, really exploring that history of hacking and in general, uh, the history of how bug bounties came to their current form in InfoSec and the impact that this has specifically on the labor market. So we really encourage you to check out those two recent works. They are just there by our data and society colleagues. And we wanna fast forward you to the early 2010. At this point, we're starting to see an already widespread use of bug bounty programs, often in combination with other vulnerability disclosure programs and with pen testing. And it's also a moment where we really see the rise of major bug bounty platforms like HackerOne, BugCrowd, Yes We Hack. And of course, this is after the first uh, big bug bounty programs for the US government, Hack the Pentagon. And so at this point, even some of the largest players in tech use uh, bug bounties and use bug bounty platforms to solicit entry as reports. And for hackers, those platforms offer a more consistent user experience, access to many programs in one place, a repository of past reports to learn from, and sometimes also a genuine community. However, even in those early heady days of the bounty everything hype, people really caution that bounties will not work unless the organization offering them are deeply committed to secure development practices throughout the entire product lifecycle. And that's really a concept that we think translates well to the space of algorithmic harms, which is this focus on not just one moment in the development, but really on the full life cycle. In short, bounties have never been silver bullets. So now let's fast forward again. Boom, we're in 2018. And this is when the Cambridge Analytica controversy makes headlines. Less than a month later, 
Facebook and Google shortly after that announced bug bounties for data and API abuse. Now that's similar to traditional bug bounties, but it's also really different from a program perspective. They have to be configured very differently to tackle this new type of issues. This highlights the PR value of bug bounties as band-aids in a crisis. Also, in October 2018, there's at least one other organization that stretches the bound of traditional bounties to surface algorithmic harms, and that's Rockstar Game. In response to claims of false positive uh, ban punishments from gamers who are facing bans from Rockstar's cheat flagging algorithms, uh, the company sets up an add-on to its security bounty, promising a $10,000 reward for anyone who can successfully identify a reproducible incorrect ban, either in Grand Theft Auto or in Red Dead. So what do we learn from this expansion of bug bounty programs to data and API and to cheat flagging algorithms that happens around 2018? First, we learned that bug bounty programs clearly can be applied to socio-technical challenges beyond traditional security uh, vulnerabilities. That's a trend that we document and that we think will accelerate. Second, we learned that there are lessons from cybersecurity bug bounties that really apply into new domains. We also think that there are lessons that need to be unlearned. But here, we see that Google and Facebook brought um, their legal safe harbor over from their security bounties to come into this new programs on data abuse. These safe harbor clauses can help reassure researchers that they won't be sued by the targets for potential copyright, DRM infringement, computer fraud and abuse act, or defamations, etc. We also learned that companies will set up bug bounties for algorithmic harms if it makes business sense to do so, like address PR or customer concerns, and if it feels safe for them to do so. Now let's take on to our next vignette. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Twitter's bias bounty. So recently for DEF CON 2021, Twitter announced a one week algorithmic bias bounty challenge. The program was created by Twitter's machine learning, ethics, transparency and accountability or Meta team in partnership with HackerOne. And yes, they had the name Meta before Meta was Meta. Uh, anyway, Twitter's bias bounty focused on an image cropping algorithm that users felt was biased in ways that reinforce racism and sexism. In 2020, Twitter users had performed a participatory audit. They shared screenshots of image crop fails on social media. And we have a slide that sort of demonstrates that. In-house researchers from Twitter later published research confirming these users' findings. Through the DEF CON challenge, Twitter offered an opportunity for third-party researchers to scrutinize their model with bounties for the top three submissions. The company also produced a scoring rubric for algorithmic bias and harms. Our team was thrilled to see all this happen. And we think they did a lot of things right. We also think that this case study illustrates the difficulty of applying bug bounties to algorithmic harms. For example, their scoring rubric gave more points for problems that affected the most people even though that implies deprioritizing small groups of people who might be at most risk of suffering the worst kinds of algorithmic harm. So as a trans person, for example, any um, scoring rubric that says you, you get the most points if it applies to the most people in the world, well, if you're part of a tiny population, then you're gonna feel excluded, like this isn't set up to support your community. Now, Twitter didn't provide any scores publicly, so it's hard to assess how useful the rubric was in practice. In addition, while it's great to see these kinds of programs emerging in response to controversies, in all the cases we looked at, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, the original reporters of the issues, the ones who first put in the work to document and expose the harms, were not rewarded by the programs. On the other hand, there's also an important change management lesson here, because we think that Twitter saw an opportunity where stars were aligned in favor of doing something novel, in our interviews, we heard again and again the importance of finding the right pilot program. So that was the case, for example, with the Hack the Pentagon program. You do a pilot first so that then you can expand bounties um, you know, across uh, the organization. So we think that several factors were key to minimizing the risk to Twitter for their, for their, um, their program. First of all, 
harms from the image cropping algorithm had already been exposed by users. So the reputational damage had already been incurred. Second, Twitter had already published an examination of the system's flaws and was already planning to decommission the algorithm. So that mitigated further risk of public criticism. And third, the crop algorithm was open source rather than proprietary. So even when they opened it up, they weren't exposing any IP. All right, now let's pivot to who else could use bug bounties for algorithmic harms in our last vignette. During the pandemic, many schools and many universities rapidly switched to remote learning. And a lot of them started using e-proctoring systems that monitor students remotely. There are a lot of problems with these systems. For instance, as we know, a lot of these systems use facial recognition technologies that perform less well on students with darker skin. At least one researcher, Oxalibrium on their blog Proctor Ninja, reverse engineered the widely used remote proctory system Proctor.io and found that it was using a facial recognition training library that is not meant for production environments and that is known to perform poorly on darker skin. People subject to these technologies have been speaking up, like the students activists at ENCODE Justice. And if we take a step back, another key trend that we observe throughout the history of book bounties is that the few attempts at truly adversarial programs did not last very long or succeed widely. There are a few notable exceptions for programs that live within large and well-funded corporations like Project Zero at Google, but besides these, adversarial bounties have not really found their final form. We think that here, there is a great opportunity to more meaningfully tackle algorithmic harms. And our proposal is simple. Adversarial bounties for algorithmic harms. So this slide shows the way that we might configure uh, that type of adversarial bias and harm bounty. The reporting would be adversarial. The compensation would be a bounty. Disclosure would be delayed, but full disclosure. Participation would be public. The program management would be third party platform. So not a traditional platform where the target is paying a platform to host, but a third party is doing so. The duration would be time limited and the scope and access would be expansive and closed box. So if this sounds interesting or exciting to you and you wanna participate or you wanna debate the details with us and you think the model should be tweaked a little bit, get in touch with us, sign up for AJL's mailing list. And if you have ideas for targets of adversarial algorithmic harm BBPs, let us know. And if you decide to run your own adversarial algorithmic harm BBP, we'd love to hear about it. So thank you so much. And please do visit ajl.org slash bugs to learn more and to download the full report, which is just full of lots of great information. Thanks, everybody.